Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Christmas Eve devotional. My name is Mike Wagstaff. I'll be sharing some Christmas thoughts with you. And our reading today leads us nicely into those thoughts. And it is Luke 2, verses 1 to 7. Now, let me just see if I can share the screen. Um, and I can't find the piece I want to do. Oh, here it is, devotionals. Hold shift to select multiple windows. Oh, goodness sake. Um, that's not working, is it? Okay, I'm going to read it to you, all right? At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius, the, the, this was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancee, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there were no lodgings available for them. Or there was no room at the inn. So the long promised saviour is finally born. Eagerly expected across many generations and prophesied in the Old Testament and born in very humble circumstances due to a census, which caused Mary and Joseph to be away from home. And we all know that there was no room at the inn. And if it were happening today, there would be probably no Zoom at the inn either. Returning to the passage, um, we see the ancient link to King David, which caused them to be away in, Beth in Bethlehem in the first place. So what does the birth mean? Well, for starters, there is peace and goodwill to all men. There is hope for the future. God has finally come to be in our midst, and this is a cause for celebration. And so the most difficult, unusual of Christmases is upon us. What I'd like to do on this Christmas Eve is consider some of the Christmases of the past where celebrations were also marked by difficulties. The first one, which to be topical I shall call tier one, goes back 106 years to the Christmas Eve of 1914. Earlier in that year on the 4th of August, <clears throat> Great Britain had entered the First World War. There were great celebrations and people re were eager to get stuck in. However, others saw it for what it actually became, which was a long and bloody conflict. Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Secretary at the time, looked out of his palatial Imperial London office and said, the lamps are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our time. And how right he was. So it was Christmas Eve, 1914, and we are about to witness the remarkable impact of Christmas because an event occurred which was not repeated again in the First World War. An official spontaneous truce took place along the Western Front. It often started with a ceasefire as Christmas Day approached. A then enemy German officer recalled how initially this caused some concern. He says, on Christmas Eve at noon, gunfire ceased completely on both fronts. Of course, it was unusual that the opposite side also ceased fire. Then my officer controlling the sentries came in and said, do you expect a surprise attack? Because it's a very unusual situation. I said, I, I don't think so. But anyhow, everyone is awake, no one is sleeping and the sentries are still on duty. So I think it's all right. A British private explained how the close proximity of the enemy led to increased communication between the two sides. We were in the front line. We were about 300 yards from the Germans. And we, we had, I think, on Christmas Eve, we'd been singing carols and this and that and the other. 
and the Germans have been doing the same. And we've been shouting at each other, sometimes rude remarks, more often just joking remarks. Anyway, eventually a German said, tomorrow, you know shoot, we know shoot. And the morning came and we didn't shoot and they didn't shoot. So then we began to pop our heads over the side and jump down quickly in case they shot, but they didn't. And then we saw a German standing up and waving his arms and we didn't shoot and so on. And it gradually grew. And another soldier recalls, we heard a German singing Holy Night, of course in German, naturally. Then after he'd finished singing, there were all sorts of Christmas greetings being shouted across no man's land at us. These Germans shouted out, what about you singing Holy Night? Well, we had a go, but of course we weren't very good at it. Anyway, they said, meet us and come over in no man's land. And after a time we were allowed, limited numbers of us. And finally this account. When we were on that line in Sali in Christmas 1914, there was a bit of a truce there, you know, and the Germans stopped firing, we stopped firing. And we came out of our line and they came out of their line. And we were sopping tins of bully for their tins of meat and the Padre was out having a talk with them. They were burying any dead that there were and we were burying any dead of ours. That carried on for about a couple of days. The bully spoken of there, by the way, is bully beef, which was what the food rations were called in the First World War. So now moving on to our next difficult Christmas, which we will call tier two. And for this, we fast forward to 1939 with the country about to descend into further crisis at the outbreak of the Second World War. In 1932, King George V initiated the tradition of broadcast to the nation on Christmas Day. By 1939, that tradition had lapsed. The monarchy had been in crisis. Early in 1936, King George V had died and his son Edward VIII ascended to the throne. But by December 1936, he was gone, having abdicated and passing the mantle to his ill-prepared and shy younger brother, who became King George VI. His problems with public speaking were well known and were the subject of the 2010 film, The King's Speech. However, in only his second major public speech as King, and after his speech treatment, therapy treatment with Lionel Logue had ended, he gave his 1939 Christmas message to the nation. George VI, this shy and troubled king, bravely lifted the nation as he delivered these memorable lines, and I quote, And I said to the man who stood in at the gate of the year, Give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, Go out into the darkness and put your hand in the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than the known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God trod gladly into the night and he led me towards the hills and the breaking of the day in the lone east. A message of supreme hope from a very courageous man. And as we heard yesterday from Julian, leading towards the dawn and a new dawn. I spoke once of my good friend Arthur, an elder in my previous church who had been blinded in an acid attack during the 1970s. He was invited one year to the Queen's summer garden party in Buckingham Palace, and he was presented to Her Majesty. And when he was presented, he thanked her for what her father had said back in 1939, and he congratulated her on following in his footsteps. One of the courtiers came up to Arthur afterwards and said, that was the nicest thing that had been said to the Queen today. And now moving on swift, swiftly to our tier three Christmas, which I have, and the one I have chosen is the Christmas of 1973, which I do recall. A Christmas of Morecambe and Wise and other notables. 1973 was a year beset with difficulties caused by industrial strife and disruption. The results were power cuts, fuel, fuel shortages, and the outlook wasn't good. Sales of candles soared. The government was in turmoil and would be gone by early 1974. And onto the scene that year burst a brash band from Wolverhampton called Slade with their Christmas anthem, Merry Christmas Everybody. 
They wrote the song earlier, but in July of that year decided to finish it to cheer everyone up after what had become such an awful year. One of the lyrics said, everybody's having fun, look to the future, it's only just begun, I'm sure you know. What was needed at the time was a sense of optimism and fun with the Christmas at that time in danger of being submerged by strife and difficulties that the nation found itself in. Does that sound familiar? This song, as you know, has gone on to become a Christmas standard, blaring out in various supermarkets at this time of year, but was released at the time to reflect what was going on. And so we come to tier four and this Christmas of 2020. What will this Christmas be like? And indeed, what will the future hold? Well, for some clues and guidance, let's look back again at those Christmases past, which we've called tier one to tier three and see what we can learn. Firstly, our tier one Christmas of 1914. Nothing illustrates more the power of the Christmas message than this. Were these people in the First World War trenches believers? Probably not. But yet the message of Christmas had reached down into their pitiful situations. It had penetrated the hatred and the wet trenches. For a little while on that Christmas Eve in 1914, there was camaraderie amongst sworn enemies. For a short while, they forgot that they were supposed to be shooting each other dead and instead joined together in singing and games of football. And the British were actually singing German speaking carol, the German speaking carol Silent Night, still in Nach. You see, Christmas, despite all the commercialism, still has the power to affect and change our fellow man if only for a few days or, or hours. Going to church becomes a bit more fashionable in the lead up to Christmas. And on Christmas Eve itself, late night services are normally packed out. Although this year, it will of course be different. Two Mondays ago, Julian mentioned Isaiah 11 verse six, where it says the lion shall lie with the lamb. And that was virtually what was happening here. Thanks to Christmas and a little child, the full verse says, a lion will lie with a lamb and a little child will lead them all. And what about our tier two Christmas of 1939? Well, that shows us that the only way is God's way. Go out into the darkness, put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be to you better than light and safer than the known way. The only way to first face this uncertain and dark future is with God and being led by his hand to step out into the seeming darkness which is the future and be guided by him that is surely faith in action he will guide our futures whatever they may hold brexit or no brexit covid or otherwise and remember that picture yesterday of the dawn again it continues so i went forth and finding the hand of god trod gladly into the night and he led me towards the hills and the breaking of the day in the lone east. And as Richard Peace pointed out on Tuesday, we are all in need of direction. We need to hear God clearly. And let's remind ourselves of what Alistair shared last Wednesday from Jeremiah. There is hope for tomorrow, hope that is real and good and will happen. And so to our tier three Christmas of 1973, which was about enjoying ourselves despite all the hardships around us and within. It is about doing our best to have a good time. Even the soldiers in the First World War trenches managed to do that. So surely we can have a go and do likewise. And finally to tier four and the Christmas of 2020, the story that is about to be written. This Christmas comes what after what for some has been indeed been an awful year. And we too need cheering up a bit. But do look ahead with optimism, despite all you are reading, God is still with us. Please take heart that the messages, the message of Christmas remains the same and is constant. Good year or bad, 1914, 1939, 1973, or 2020. For what is demonstrated is that the message does remain constant. We have seen the effect 
1914 as enemies became friends. And we saw the message of tremendous hope. That message of salvation through the birth of our saviour remains. No amount of difficulty can change that message. And from 1939, we see that God will light the path before us as we head into a dark and uncertain 2021. And from 1973, we see that it is possible to have a good time despite everything. So let's use whatever opportunity Christmas provides to tell, us, tell others about our salvation. Again, it can be easier at this time of year. So as I draw to a close, let me compare two passages, one from the old and again, a verse from today's passage. In 1 Kings 19 verse 3, King Hezekiah speaks after being threatened by the Assyrians. He says, today is a day of trouble, insults and disgrace. It is like when a child is ready to be born, but the mother has no strength to deliver the baby. And from today's passage, and while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. You see, God did have the strength to deliver the baby, his son. So please remember the saviour who is born to save the world, who is born to save the world, does still exert some influence over the population at large. Our job is to capitalise on that. Maybe, just maybe, this Christmas, rather like that Christmas 106 years ago in 1914, the lion will indeed lie down with the lamb. Or like our tier two Christmas 81 years ago in 1939, we will allow God to light the way ahead. Or the tier three Christmas of 47 years ago in 1973, that we will, despite everything, be able to have a good time. So let's resolve that this tier four Christmas of 2020 is the best it can possibly be. And maybe, dare we believe it, even one of the best. We should certainly not aim for anything less. And finally, this Christmas, Jupiter and Saturn have aligned in the night sky. And there is a new star in the sky this year. The Christmas of 2020 has a star, maybe a sign of renewed hope. We are told that the two planets, the largest in the solar system and some of the brightest objects visible in the night sky, have not been this close to each other in the dark sky for 800 years. And that even predates Ken Shepherd. So look up, look to the future. There is a star shining over us and a new dawn beckons. And in the words of the 1973 song from Slade, may I say, as we pass over to Ken briefly and then go to prayer, Merry Christmas, everybody. Over to Ken. Is he there? Carry on. Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, carry on, we're waiting for you. Right, okay. Well, um, what about a Christmas um, 2000 years ago and there were shepherds living in the fields? Now these shepherds we've talked about before were unlearned, undisciplined and irreligious and yet when <clears throat> God came within half an hour they were running to the stable and they worshipped God they, they were absolutely overwhelmed in that period of time um, they were utterly changed went out into the community and told everyone God's the same now and this is really, you can say, it's a revival when the, the shepherds were there. We expect a revival. God is going to come in revival and he's going to do the same things as happened to the shepherds. He changes people immediately when they come to him. And that is what we expect. I expect some, by this, this COVID thing, I think God's going to work his purposes out. And I, I think um, 2021, we want to watch it. 
to see whether God is going to do something utterly amazing in our midst, a revival in our midst. Is he going to do it? Who knows? But it's in his hands. And if he does, we'll have people like the shepherds in our midst um, that we need to deal with. And when a lot of people come in revival, we will all be needed to step up and work out. But we'll be utterly work overwhelmed by him when he comes. That is a special Christmas. <laughs>